morning. Let me welcome you this morning to our services here at Central. We are glad you're here. This is a very special day for us. We've talked about it. We've thought about it. We've been praying for it. Uh, have been excited about the possibilities of what God could do for two years now. It's hard to imagine it's here, but it is. So we welcome you. We're glad you're here. If you're a visitor, we're especially glad to have you. We hope you'll feel at home and welcomed. Uh, please do us a kindness, if you would, and just fill out the uh, visitor slip in the pew ahead of you, and you can just drop in the offering box at the back of the service just to let us know you're here, and we'd like to just communicate with you. Now, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the Silver Team because you met them a couple of years ago. Some have changed, but... Uh, uh, Shane Black and Garrett Lee are still the team leaders and uh, gentlemen if you'll just stand just so they'll be able to recognize you uh, their wives Lee <laughs> Lee Black and Amanda Lee and uh, so they are here as well and will be involved in the uh, things going on this week I've been praying that God would grant us a time of refreshing there's just something about that phrase that sounds exciting to me and you know something just in talking with the team in the last couple of days God is doing things around in different churches. And I rejoice to hear that. But you know what? I'm just a little jealous. I want God to do something here. I want God to do something in my heart, in your heart. And so we're glad you're here to be a part of this. Won't it be something if God really did grant a time of refreshing? And you didn't begin to understand what God wanted to do in your heart and life. My friend, that could happen. It could begin today. I want us to just join together in prayer, and we're going to turn the services over to the Silver Team. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me that this really would be a summit conference that brings a time of refreshing both to you and to our church. All right? Let's do that right now. Lord, you are good to your people, and we know that. We see your blessings all around us. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing because you're always working, just like the songs say, you're always working. Even when we can't see it, you're working and we know that. And Father, I'm grateful that behind the scenes you've been putting together this summit, this summit conference and that you're gonna do some things. And Lord, I just give you permission to work in my heart. Lord, do what you will. I pray, Father, you'd be glorified, not just in my life and in my wife Phyllis's life. But I pray, Father, in this church, you would be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for Shane and Garrett, their love for you, their commitment to your church. We pray you'd use them to touch our hearts today. We commit this series of meetings to you, trusting that you're going to work. In Jesus' name. Father, I'm so excited for what you have for us this week. God, I don't know where you're trying to bring us. I don't know where many of us are right now, God, but you know our hearts. You know us intimately. So God, we open ourselves to you. God, we're gonna praise you this week even when we don't feel like it. Father, we love you. And in your son's most holy name we pray, amen. Amen, you could be seated. Well, good morning, Central Baptist Church. Wave at me this morning. It is so good to see all of you guys today. We are so excited to be back in Crossville, Tennessee. We've already began to explore the area again. It's like we're back at home. It is wonderful. And to see some of your faces and get to see some of you out in public, Miss Pat and Miss, Mr. Orville, seeing them last night at Cracker Barrel and uh, getting to see some of your faces. Good to see Leland again. Um, Leland told me that I looked skinnier than I did last time, like I'd done a marathon. What do you think? I've actually gained 15 pounds because of COVID. I did COVID break. I mean, I was like, I don't have anywhere to go. Let's eat. And so I did. Um, and it's, so now I'm trying to get that back off. And so maybe, maybe we'll do a marathon this week. We could do it, me and you. Okay, he's excited. I'm not. Um, well, guys, it is a joy. And as your pastor said, my name is Shane Black, and we are the silver team. You may remember we have three teams that travel around the United States, the blue team, the red team, and the silver team. And our sole desire is to inspire your next yes to God. That's what we were just singing about. Imagine, church, if all of our days we said, yes, I will. To whatever the Lord said, yes, I will. We dream 
of millions of God-astonished lives that are living in action with Him with the sole purpose of shattering injustice, lostness, and division. Can you imagine if the church of Jesus Christ lived that way? Amen. That's what we're called to. That's what we're called to. Well, I want to invite my beautiful bride to come up here. Uh, Lee and I have been married for 26 wonderful years. Uh, we have 10 children, and we have uh, six with them here on earth. And um, we live in an RV out on church parking lots for nine months out of the year. And I want to um, let her introduce our family to you. She's going to introduce six of our children. We get to travel with 20. And 20 young men and women that have surrendered their lives to at least a year to do what God's called us to do. So, honey, why don't you introduce our children off of the pictures up here? Okay, well, good morning. It is so good to be with you guys. So excited. I am especially excited because I missed the entire conference last time. So, um, but here's our family. Uh, this last August, we had a wedding. Our oldest girl, Grace, who was up here singing the last time we were here, married Josh. So now we have two Joshuas. So Josh and Grace were married in August, and she is 20. And Lindsay is beside, um, on the other side of Josh, and she's also up here. She is, I think, 19. Did that happen? That happened. It did. <laughs> on the opposite side, off of my right shoulder, is Margaret. She is 16. Back to the other side, behind Lindsay, is Emma Kate. She's also behind me. She's 15. And Anna Claire is our um, baby girl. She is 13. Pause so just a, a moment. A lot of girl teenagers. Did, did you hear all of that? Four teenage girls <laughs> in my house. Three of them in a 600-foot RV all the time. I can't hide. So you're going to commit to pray for me this week, right? Thank you. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's okay. And then the cherry on top, of course, Joshua is 11. So you should probably pray for him too because not only are they his sisters, but they are his mothers as well. So they're constantly correcting and bossing. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua. <laughs> um, now, honey, um, you and Amanda have something wonderful for the ladies coming up this Thursday. So why don't yes. you tell us about that? So, okay, on Thursday, we're going to get together, us ladies and the team. Amanda and I and the team are going to host a luncheon for you where we're going to get together and we're going to prepare a uh, lunch and feed you and then clean it up. We're going to get together with you, share out of our lives what God is um, speaking into our hearts and our families. We're going to want to hear your stories and, and what God is doing in your lives. We want to pray together. We want to open God's Word together and just love on you. If there are people in your community that are maybe a little timid about coming to a, a group this big, ladies' luncheons are typically a little more intimate and they're a little less scary for some ladies. So please use that opportunity to invite her. I believe you can sign up out in your uh, welcome area or online. We have a little saying, it's come when you can, leave when you must. So we actually set aside tables for you where if you have to slip in a little later, leave a little early, that is fine. Uh, we want to share some, some gifts and goodies with you and mostly God's Word and just His hope and how awesome and perfect He is. And so we hope to see you there. Thank you so oh, much. Uh, if you bring your children, there will be child care, but you'll need to pack them a sack lunch. That's right. Thank you so much, Thank love. Thank you. Well, guys, I'd like for you to meet someone else. Garrett, why don't you come on up here? Garrett Lee and his wife Amanda travel with Lee and I and... Uh, we get to do this life together. Uh, not only do we get to lead the team together, but we are dear, dear friends. Yeah. And it's good to be on the road nine months out of the year with a friend. Yes, so it is. Garrett, why don't you share with your heart with us, buddy? Love, Love you, bud. All right. Thank you all so much for welcoming us again. Uh, I was so excited when I got the call from someone in our office letting me know that uh, Central Baptist Church had locked in their dates for their summit. Uh, last time we were here, uh, we were brand new to this life. Uh, this was our third conference for my family, uh, so we barely knew what we were doing. So thank you all for being so patient with us. Uh, so we still barely know what we're doing, but uh, we're, we're excited to have more time to spend with you and pour into your lives. I wanted to let you know about a few things going on this week. Uh, as you know, we're having some special meetings. Uh, I wanted to uh, let you know about the times for those meetings. Make sure everybody has those written down 
uh, correctly. Tonight, we're meeting back here at 6 p.m. sharp. And then each night this week, except for Friday, Monday through Thursday night, we're going to be here at 6.30. Uh, we'll be starting right at 6 tonight and 6.30 through the week uh, with some teaching from God's Word on relationships, both in the family and outside of the family. So we'll all be starting sharp uh, right at right on time so we can uh, we don't waste any of your time when we get here. Uh, but love to see you there for those evening sessions. Um, and then I also wanted to let you know about something else going on this week. Uh, on Saturday, this is a Home Life Cafe. This is a special feature of our summit conferences. We're going to spend four hours together digging through God's Word and digging deep to, again, talk about uh, how to have godly relationships with each other. Uh, Shane and I will talk a little bit more about that later this week, give you a few more details. But I wanted to make sure you were able to write that down in your calendar and start planning. Uh, there will be uh, some stuff for adults, students, kids. We'll, ha we'll have the whole gamut available for you. Uh, but Saturday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., uh, mark it down, and we'll see you there. Now, I mentioned our kids. Uh, if you have kids with you this morning, uh, they are already in the kids' clubs, uh, but we will be having clubs for them uh, at, during each service this week. Uh, as you can see, we have base camp for our second through sixth graders uh, over in the multi-purpose room, and then Happy Heart City, which sounds really fun for our four-year-olds uh, four to first graders in rooms nine and 10. Uh, our team members, our children's ministers, will be serving them teaching them things from God's words that are mirroring what we'll be talking about in the services together. Uh, just a note about the kids and any, ki any of your students that are in the boonies this morning. I love that. You call your youth room the boonies. <laughs> um, you're, they're going to start in clubs and with our student revivalist in the boonies when they come back tonight. So when you come at 6 tonight, 6.30 each evening, you're going to drop your kids off in the children's and children and student wing, and adults are going to gather here for the main service. And then finally, I uh, just wanted to note that uh, once again, if you remember from last time, we have a booklet for you. Uh, this is going to be your guide through the week. There's information here about different ways we would like to serve you and minister to you. Uh, but primarily, there's some worksheets and some things that we're going to be working through together as we go through this summit conference. So I want to make sure if you snuck in without getting a booklet, I'd like you to raise your hand now. We need to. We have a couple of team members that are going to bring those to you. They're walking through the uh, sanctuary right now. Keep your hand up high. Uh, husbands, you cannot use your wife's booklet. You have to take your own notes, okay? She serves you a lot of other ways. You're going to take your own notes this week. So just raise your hand and uh, keep it raised until a team member finds you. Wave at them to get, get their attention, and they'll make sure that you get one of these for the week. All right. I'm going to turn it back over to the band now. Thank you so much for welcoming, welcoming us. God bless you. Well, church, we're going to invite you to reflect on the words as we begin to sing and respond however God leads you. If that means keep sitting, if that means stand, just whatever the Lord's telling you. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name.
neighbor and say, Jesus, what a beautiful name. Now turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus, what a powerful name. Church, that's why we're here. It's all about Jesus. He's the reason We choose to come and to cry out together with you this week. We desperately want to meet with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much, team. What a blessing. Well, we call this a summit conference. How many of you uh, would say that this is your first Life Action Conference? Raise your hand. Let me see you. Okay, I see some of you. Amen. Well, it is so good uh, to be with you guys. Again, this is a summit conference. Uh, the question is, why, why are we here? Well, I, I want us to picture in our mind um, this idea of climbing a mountain, if you will. We, we're taking a journey to the summit, to the, to the top of the mountain. What is at the top of the mountain? Well, we're headed toward what we're going to call the revived life. The Bible references the revived life all through scriptures in different ways. Um, It's talked about as the abundant life. It's talked about the joy-filled life, the vibrant Christian life, the victorious Christian life, the spirit-filled Christian life. life. So the, the question that we all have to ask ourselves this morning is, do those words actually describe where we're living? 
Like, is, is that my address? I'm joy-filled. I'm spirit-filled. I'm living the abundant, overflowing, vibrant Christian life. See, our desire this, guy, this week, guys, is not to have a week of meetings. We, we have nothing inside of us that says, you know what? We want to come and meet with Central Baptist Church and then go home after a week of just gathering. That's not our desire at all. Rather, our desire this week is to meet with the reviver of our souls, to seek after him, to long for him, to, to cry for him. We're asking that he come, listen to me carefully, that he come and mess us up. We're asking that he come and wreck us. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus needs to wreck you. Now, if we're honest this morning, we're like, Roland, Jesus needs to wreck you, but I prefer he leave me alone. <laughs> right? That, if we're honest, that's what we're really saying to each other. I mean, I want everybody else to be wrecked because we know if God would come and wreck you, we would have revival at Central Baptist Church because you are definitely the problem. <laughs> now, we wouldn't say that out loud, but deep inside, that's really what many of us think. See, guys, we desire for Jesus to revive us. Now, revival is not a word that we, we often use anymore, but for those of us that are familiar um, with the word revival, we may have different ideas in our mind of what it actually looks like or what it really is. But, but on a very basic level, revival means to do life again. If we break that word down, re means to do again, vive means life. And so revival is not for the lost world, revival is for believers. It's when God comes and interrupts us at the core of who we are and we begin to live saying yes to him in every aspect of our life. So today when we think about revival, I want us to think of God drawing his people back to himself and back to the life that he calls us to live as believers so that you and I actually respond to him in every area of our life with a yes. Yes, Lord. I give you my yes, and now I say you insert the question, Lord. I'm saying yes before I even know what you're going to ask of me. You see, revival is simply saying yes to God. God speaks of revival in his word all through scripture. We see people falling away from a right relationship with him and then being drawn back to him. A, a few months ago, uh, Lee was having her quiet time and she says, you know, honey, I see all through scripture the same theme. We're either following after Jesus we're rebelling against Jesus, we're being rebuked by Jesus, or we're being redeemed by Jesus. Every single one of us in this room are living somewhere on that road. We're either following him, we're rebelling against him, we're under his rebuke, or we're, we're living in the blessing of redemption. Now get this, this is the beautiful thing, God knows right where you are. He sees you, he knows you, and he's willing to meet you right where you are. He's brought you here, and he's brought me here, and he's brought your neighbor here this morning by an act of his sovereign will. None of us are here by chance. So, so why does he have us here? Because his desire is to revive you. God wants to invite us to say yes to him. Turn to your neighbor this morning and say, God wants you to say yes to him. Look at the screen with me. Psalm 85. Notice what it says. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? This verse speaks of a direct connection, watch this, between our joy and revival. Maybe we're not experiencing rejoicing individually or corporately in our churches because we're not a revived people. Maybe we're allowing the circumstances of our lives to rob us of the joy that revival brings. Now, this psalm was a community prayer, and, and it sums up our desire in these days. The people of God were facing some type of affliction or distress in their lives, and, and they cried out to God for help. Now, let me ask you this morning, what are you facing? What are you facing right now 
in your life. Maybe you're experiencing personal times of distress or affliction in your finances or in your relationships with your spouse or your children or your siblings or your neighbor or, or maybe even in ministry you're experiencing times of affliction and distress or, or maybe in your job or, or maybe in your health. Some of you right now are thinking, dude, COVID. <laughs> That's a distress, right? That, that's been hard on us for the last several months. It's rocked my world. Or maybe you would say this morning, no, Shane, listen, dude, life is really good for me right now. And I'm sure that, that you guys have been praying about our time together, but my question is, is in your heart of hearts, is this your desire, that God would revive you again so that your rejoicing returns God wants to do this for you, to turn to your neighbor and say, God wants me to say yes to him. The first one was easier, wasn't it? Yeah. When I told you to turn to your neighbor and say, God wants you, you're like, oh, yes, God wants you. But when it comes time to say, God wants me, you're like, well, can I leave it to you, right? I don't know if, if God wants me to say yes to him. We were in Pontotoc, Mississippi not too long ago, and this is what Jackie had to say. Before the conference, I was skeptical. I questioned the necessity of attending church services for eight days. Now, I'm just curious. little poll this morning. This is church. We can be honest with each other. How many of you thought your pastor had lost his ever-loving mind when he scheduled for us to come back for eight days? Like, uh, you, you're in church. You better be honest. Like, none of you, right? Right. I mean, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking eight days. Do you realize my schedule? Do you realize how busy I am, Pastor Roland? I have a life. I have a job. I have to take care of the dog. How am I going to go to church for eight days? Right? That, that was Jackie. Jackie went on. She says, I thought it was way too much time out of my schedule. And I voiced that to my friends and my coworkers. You see, I'd grown cold and apathetic toward the things of God. Is that you this morning? She said, I'd fallen into the rut of religion. And then I love her testimony. She gives us the symptoms of the rut of her religion. Notice what she says. I sing in the choir. I help teach four-year-old Sunday school every week. I work in children's ministry every other week. That was the symptom of her rut of religion. But she continues, watch what she says. But none of it was with the right heart attitude. And God convinced me this week of my distance from him. He met with me on Tuesday night, and I confessed my sin of a hardened heart. God has restored my joy in him and has given me a new touch of fire and revival to continue my walk with him. Jackie encountered God, and she went from times of affliction and distress to times of rejoicing. That's our desire. I want you to open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, and open in your workbook to page 8. Isaiah chapter 6, if you open up in the center of your Bible, you'll find Isaiah chapter 6. Let me help you. It's page 732 in my Bible. Okay, maybe, maybe that helped you. Maybe you can put that in some formula or something and find it. In your, I don't know. Isaiah chapter 6, page 8 in your workbook. This morning, uh, I want us to focus on the holiness of God. Who really is this God that we desire to meet with this week? What do we really know about him? What does it really mean that he is a holy God? We're going to begin each session with what I'm going to call a revival truth. This is going to be your first fill-in in your notes there. Remember, um, uh, Garrett told you, um, husbands, you, you can't read your wife's booklet. You've got to take your own notes this morning, okay? So here's our first fill-in. The revived life flows from a new understanding of and response to the holiness of God. You see, church, we will not be revived individually or corporately until we truly see God for who he is. Your view and your understanding of who God is is the most significant factor in determining how you're going to live your life. All through Scripture, we see people that have an inadequate view of God, and then, they, and then through different situations in their life, they have this beautiful, overwhelming encounter with God, and then they walk away with a completely new view and understanding of who He is. And we're going to see soon that Isaiah had an encounter like that with God. 
Again, your view and my view and understanding of God and, and then your understanding of yourself in light of God will determine the decisions that you make in your life, how you live your life, how you respond to temptations in your life, how you look at sin, how you treat those around you, the activities that you participate in, the, the shows that you watch, the music that you listen to. See, every single one of us are living at one of two different addresses. This is where we're living. We either have a very big view of God and a very little view of ourselves, or we have a very big view of ourselves and a very little view of God. Every one of us in the room, we're living at one of those two addresses. Imagine with me that we visited the streets of Crossville and we went around and found all the believers and gathered them, them together and asked them, um, what is God like? Most of them will answer this way, God is love. And that's true, God is love, but for most of them, what they're really saying by saying God is love is they're saying that he's like this beautiful gray-headed grandfather in the sky that just wants everybody down here to get along. That's the, that's the God that most people view. But when we go to the Word and, and we ask that same question, what is this God like? The resounding answer we get is God is holy. God is holy. When we read scripture, there's no doubt that God is communicating to us that this is where our relationship with him must start. God says, in order to have a relationship with me, you must first understand and then respond to my holiness. Now, if we're honest this morning, we know very little about holiness. We use the word holy very loosely. We, we say that a lot of things are holy. We say cows are holy, holy cow. We, we say that smoke is holy, holy smoke. We say that mackerel is holy, holy mackerel. I've never seen a holy mackerel. I don't know. We say that moly is holy. I don't even know what that is, holy moly. I, I, I don't know. But, but we say those things. So today, let's reclaim the word holy again. What does it really mean? And then, how does it actually affect the way that I do my life? Here's our question this morning. Does God's holiness really, at the foundational level of who I am, affect the way that I live my life? You've been waiting patiently. Isaiah chapter 6. Before we begin to dive into God's Word, here's what I want you to do. If you got your Bible this morning, raise it up. We're going to have a Bible drill. I want to see your Bible. Let me help some of you. Hold on. Okay. Bible. Right? Here's what I want to do. Um, I'm going to pray for us this morning, but as I pray, I want you to have a very personal conversation with Jesus. Don't listen to my prayer. You talk to Jesus. And here's what I want you to say. Something like this. Lord, would you give me a fresh encounter with you. That's why I'm here, Lord. I came to church because I want to meet with you in a real personal way. So I'm going to pray. You have a conversation with Jesus like nobody else is here but just you and him. Okay? Here we go. Father, you are good. And you've called us here in your sovereign will because you desire, I believe in everything inside of me, that for, for us to meet with your Son in power and in might. And so, Lord, I confess my desperate need for you. I need a fresh encounter with you. Just like every person in this room needs a fresh encounter with you. So by faith, Lord, I ask for your Son's name's sake that you would send your Spirit to dwell in our midst. May it be so heavy that we can't work our way out from under it. May it be so, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want you to grab a hold um, in your imagination, this majestic scene of history that we're invited into. Let your, let your imagination soar for just a moment. Um, let's imagine that we're right here in the middle of this story. Go back to your childhood and try to tap in to, to your imaginative spirit this morning. Isaiah chapter 6, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You follow along in whatever version you have. God's Word says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne. He was high, and he was lifted up, and, a, and the train of his robe 
filled the temple. Verse 2, and above him stood the seraphim, and each had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Some of your translations will say the God of angel armies. That's important. Hold on to that. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Whew. Oh, that's good. What a scene from history. Isaiah lived about 700 years before the coming of Christ, and he's considered one of the most significant of, of all of the Old Testament prophets, and he finds himself in a crisis. It's a time of personal crisis for, for um, Isaiah and a time of national crisis for Judah. And the passage speaks of a king named Uzziah. Now, it's thought that Uzziah was a friend or even possibly a family member of the prophet. And King Uzziah was one of Judah's greatest leaders. And under his reign, they, they were experiencing peace and prosperity as a nation. However, their relationship with God had become more about religion than it was relationships. Sound familiar, right? They were going through the motions. Oh, they were at church every Sunday, but it was all a matter of routine. They weren't meeting with God in power and in majesty. And the scripture tells us this majestic scene takes place the year that King Uzziah died. And Isaiah is struggling with this news. Again, he finds himself at a moment of personal crisis. And it's in this setting of crisis that Isaiah has a holy encounter with God. Now, look up here at me just a moment. Get your neighbor's attention. I don't want you to miss this. Listen to me, church. We must be careful not to rush past the times of difficulty or try to pray our way out of the times of difficulty too quickly because it may be in the midst of difficulty that God really desires to meet with us. See, we've been praying, God, would you make 2020 go away? Would you make COVID go away? My prayer is, Lord, don't make it go away until you're completely done doing whatever you need to do in us. Now, guys, I know it. I, I want to be sensitive. It's hard. Some of you probably lost loved ones through that horrible disease and sickness. But listen to me. God's doing something. I don't understand it, but I don't want to miss it. And it's, notice in Isaiah's life, it's in the midst of this crisis and this difficulty that Isaiah sees God. God gives Isaiah a glimpse into heaven. And it's in this vision that God is seated on a throne high and lifted up. Don't miss the significance here. The great king, Uzziah, has left his throne on earth through death. But the greatest king is alive. And he is still seated in full authority on the throne of heaven. If we were just a little bit Baptocostal this morning, we would have gotten excited just then. That God that reigns supreme is seated upon his throne in full authority. And this king, the king of kings, gives Isaiah a new and clear understanding of his holiness. God desired in this moment to take Isaiah's eyes off of the here and the now and off of the unrest around him and cause him to focus on his majestic power, on his splendor, on his glory, on his holiness. And I believe that God wants you and I in the right here and the right now to see that he is alive though there is chaos in our government. He is alive though there is chaos of a pandemic. He is alive though, there, though we're experiencing hurt and the chaos of loss. He is alive though there's chaos in our relationships. He's alive though there's chaos in our homes. He's alive though the world has denied his existence. He is very much alive and he reigns supreme in full authority, seated upon his throne, high and lifted up. That's the king that we serve. Amen. Yeah. He's above every throne 
in full authority. And you and I are subject to that authority. Big God. Little me. You hear people say oftentimes, well, I gave God authority over my life. Listen, we don't give God authority over anything. He already has full and absolute authority. What, what does that mean? It means, listen to me, let me kind of bring it home to street level. It means he is large and in charge. Do you know that this morning? Can you feel the rest and the comfort it gives us as his people knowing that our God has full authority, this good, this loving, this compassionate, this fully authoritative God. See, trusting in his full authority, church, is our only hope for peace and for rest. We were in Leroy, Alabama in January of last year. This was a testimony. Wow. Wow. Where do I even start? I have to be honest. I was dreading this week. You see the theme? It's like, oh, they were reading my mail. <laughs> I was dreading this week too. <laughs> right? That's what they said. I was dreading this week. It was something else I had to do this week. You see, God showed me that I was my idol. I looked perfect from the outside. My husband is a deacon. I teach Sunday school. My life and my family are perfect from the outside. How many deacons in here? Raise your hand. How many Sunday school teachers? Thank you. Thank you for your service. She goes on and she said, my life and my family are perfect from the outside. People didn't see the resentment and the tension in my home. They didn't know the daily struggles. People, people ne never knew that I resented my husband and I was planning to file for a divorce and make it final. My call to obedience this week was to go home and be kind, patient, loving to my husband. And then she says this, you can't imagine how hard that was. She was like, I've got to trust in the full authority of God. How was I supposed to show love to someone that I disliked? That's what she said. But she said, I did it. The complete change in mind and my husband's relationship and interaction was an absolute miracle. God showed me I didn't have to be perfect for the first time in my life. I truly experienced rest and peace. Times of affliction and distress to times of rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. Back to our passage. Verse 1 continues on. It says, the train of his robe filled the temple. How many of you have been to a wedding before? I'm sorry. Um, so, so you've been to a wedding. You know, she's got that beautiful gown. And the, the, the train of her, of her gown, you know, is all out here. And, and then picture time comes. And the bridesmaid spend like 30 minutes getting it just perfect down the aisle, you know. And, and, and to take the picture, right? Well, well, the Bible says that the train of God's robe filled the temple. That's like two football fields side by side, down the aisle, over the pew, out the window. The splendor and the creativity of God is on display here. Can you catch a glimpse of this scene in your imagination? Now, I want to help, help you understand what God is trying to communicate to Isaiah. Remember, it, your, some of your translations says the God of angel armies. You see, when a, when a king would conquer a neighboring kingdom, he would take the train of the robe of that king, cut it off, and sew it to the end of his robe. Why? To display his dominance and his authority. And this king, the king of kings, says, I want you to see my robe. It goes over the pews, down the aisle, out the window. My splendor and majesty and dominance is on display. I am a big God and you are not. There's more. Even more specifically, God was saying, listen to me, Isaiah. Not only am I that God in full authority, but I am your God. I believe that God wanted this to be a very personal encounter for God. And I believe that he wants it to be a personal encounter for us this morning. So that you and I walk away like Isaiah did with a new understanding of the holiness of God. Remember, none of us are here by chance. So let's begin this morning with what I'm going to call um, Holiness 101, understanding the holiness of God. Here's our first point. God's holiness is one of his attributes or one of his character qualities. God's, attributes is, is, God's holiness is one of his attributes or character qualities. Now, God's 
attributes describes to us who God is and how we actually get to know Him. We will know God in light of His holiness. Now, there's many attributes of God. God is love. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is all-present. But, but again, we will truly know God in light of His holiness. We can't really understand anything else about God without first beginning with His holiness. God's holiness is foundational in understanding His love. It's foundational in understanding His grace. It's foundational in understanding His mercy. Because God's holiness burns so hot, His love and His grace and His mercy are shown in all of their power. So we say God is holy. What does that really mean? Well, it's hard for us to express because it's so so alien to us. And once we have exhausted all of our human language attempting to describe it, we would still find ourselves coming so very short of understanding what holiness really is. Why? Because holiness. God in, is the essence of holiness. When, when we say God is holy, what we're really saying is God is God. You see, to say God is holy means He is completely separate from sin. Now, being cautious not to oversimplify things here, let, let me keep it simple. Holiness is the opposite of of sin. It's not merely the absence of sin or, or even the hatred of sin, but it's a total otherness from sin. It's an uncompromising purity, a terrifying dedication to what is good and what is right. The, the primary meaning of holy is, is separate, distinct, different, special, other, set apart. So holy refers to God's transcendence. It comes from an ancient word that means to cut or to separate. I want to invite you just for a moment. Just just close your eyes for a moment. And use your imaginations. Let your imagination soar. Can you see this beautiful scene in your mind? This God is sitting upon his throne. He's high and he's lifted up and the train of his robe fills the temple. God in all of his splendor, all of his majesty, all of his holiness is on display. Open your eyes. The story continues on. Verse 2 says, above him stood the seraphim. This is the only mention in Scripture of these angelic beings by name, the seraphim, though they're described in Ezekiel and Revelation chapter 4. We know very little about them other than they were part of the heavenly host. They were heavenly creatures that were created by God specifically to serve Him in His presence day and night. And the, the term seraphim literally means burning ones or fiery ones. Can you see this picture in your mind? These fiery creatures are standing between God and Isaiah as if to symbolically say, Isaiah, stop. Don't come any closer because you are in the presence of the Holy One. Notice the scriptures, description of them. It says they have wings. With two, they flew. And with two, they covered their face as if to say, we're not worthy to look upon you. With two, they covered their feet as if to say, we're not worthy for you to even look upon us. The seraphim serve as a constant reminder to Isaiah and to us today that God is completely and utterly separate from sin. He is holy. We also see that God's holiness has given prominence over his other character qualities. Notice verse 3, and one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Notice the message of the seraphim, this choir of heavenly hosts sing back and forth to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies. The, the seraphim are singing of the holiness of God and they're singing in the threefold repetition. In the Hebrew language, a threefold repetition is used for emphasis and, and it's a way of, of expressing the superlative as, as if to say, don't miss this. This is important. God is absolute. God is utterly unique. He's in a class by himself. He's infinitely valuable. 
this character quality, the holiness of God, is the only one in Scripture that is ever elevated to the third repetition. Notice what they're not singing. They're not singing love, 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 though God is a God of love. They're not singing mercy, 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 though He's a God of mercy. And praise the Lord, they're not singing wrath, wrath, wrath. Though all of those things are true about God. It's as if God is saying, my holiness is the first thing that you need to understand about me. It's given prominence. And then verse 3 continues. I love this. It says the whole, the whole earth is full of his glory. God's glory is a manifestation of his holiness. So God's glory is on display here. And the scripture says the whole earth is full of his glory. Another way is to say the whole earth is full of his holiness. We can't deny it. We can't resist it. But listen to me, church. Something very scary has happened to us. We come to church Sunday after Sunday. We sit under the preaching of the Word of God. We worship God in song. We lift our hands. We cry out to God. And then a couple of hours later, we walk out of those doors as if we had never met with Him. We leave the same as we came. We came to church, we sang the songs, we lifted our hands, we did church, but we didn't come into the presence of God. We missed His holiness. Listen to me, church. This should terrify us. That we as God's people could do church and miss God. Look at verse verse 4. It says, when they sang of the holiness of God, the foundation of the threshold shook and smoke filled the place. The seraphim sing, God is holy, 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 and the foundation of the universe shakes. It's as if all else that was going on in the universe comes to a sudden halt and the threshold shakes. God is holy. Holy, holy. I believe that if we had been standing there, we would have felt it deep in our insides. What do you think that the Lord was trying to communicate to the people? What was he trying to impress upon his people? I am holy. Now, some of you would get all worked up if your worship pastor came in here and started um, putting smoke haze in the room during worship time. You'd be like, oh, no, he did not. God had his own smoke machine. You see, church, we get worked up about things. If we go to Scripture, we'll see smoke filled the room when God was there. Psalm 29, verse 2 says, Give unto the Lord the glory. Do His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of of holiness. You see, church, when we begin to catch a glimpse of God's holiness, the object of our worship all of a sudden becomes the glorious majesty and holiness of God, the beauty of His holiness. Again, His holiness brings the power of all His other be- uh, attributes to radiant glow. Understanding the holiness of God, He's completely separate from us. He's infinitely valuable. His value is incomparable. He is a holy God. Again, the question is, how does that affect my life? How should I respond to the holiness of God? Well, how does Isaiah respond? Isaiah is looking upon this God, the one that is the very essence of holiness, the one that defines what holiness is. Can you see the picture? Can you imagine what's going on inside Isaiah's mind? What response would you expect? Based on our response to God as believers, what would you expect? How about this? Yeah, okay, okay, God, can we get the show on the road? i got to get to lunch, God. I'm, I'm busy, God. I've got an agenda, God. Life is pretty good for me right now, God. See, guys, we tend to rush past God in our hurried lives. We don't have time to stop long enough to actually meet with God. But not Isaiah. Isaiah, probably the most righteous man of his time, responds to God. Notice what it says in verse 5. And I said, I got a glimpse of God. I was was able to see him for a moment. And my response was, woe is me. For I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, the God of angel 
armies. Now let me help you understand that woe is me phrase. It was an oracle of doom, an oracle of death. Isaiah sees God in all of his holiness, and in that moment he realizes that the only thing he deserves is death. He doesn't rush past the moment. We see similar responses from people in Scripture. You remember Luke chapter 5, verse 8, when Peter fell down at the feet of Jesus, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And John, on the Isle of Patmos, says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. Now, why does Isaiah and these others respond this way? Because for the first time, Isaiah sees God for who he truly is, and then he sees himself in light of who God is. Big God, little me. You see, a fresh, fresh understanding of the holiness God, of God brings a new awareness of sin. You see, church, when we're brought into the light of God's holiness, the complete contrast of our sinfulness is brought into clear view. And we see our sin more clearly than we have ever seen it before. Now, you, many of you are going to begin to do some spring cleaning in your home. Wonderful time of the year. We go from top to bottom and we clean everything, right? And, and you walk away at the end of that day going, wow, it smells good. It looks good. It's beautiful. You go to bed. You close your curtains. You wake up the next morning. You open up those curtains and you see all the dust fall. The light brings into view the imperfections that you missed. And that's what happens when the holiness of God begins to shine into the depths of our heart. I had a woe is me moment. 2001, Life Action came to our church, and for the first time ever, I really began to understand the Lordship of Christ. I was going to church Sunday after Sunday and doing it really well. I was serving as a deacon and doing it really well. I was serving as a Sunday school and doing it really well, but I was doing it all in my own strength. And God sh began to shine into the depths of my heart, and he began to speak into my heart. And he said, Shane, you're a man full of pride. And then he said, Shane, you're a liar. Because you see, when you're full of pride, you either tell too much truth or not enough truth. You just want yourself to look good. And then he said, Shane, you're a thief. Some 10 or 15 years prior, I went to a big chain hardware store and walked out of, of the store without paying for an item. And then he said, Shane, you're an adulterer. Not because of relationships I had prior to my marriage, I mean, during my marriage, but because of relationships I had prior to my marriage. I gave away what rightfully belonged to my wife only. And God began to peel back the layers of sin in my life. And he began to reveal to me who I really was. And my prayer is sometime this week, as I share, as Garrett shares, as the praise team leads, as your children are sitting in children time, I pray that we all have a woe is me moment. Every personal revival begins with a woe is me moment. And unless you're willing to schedule time for God, you will miss what he wants to do for you because he desperately loves you. He sees you. He knows right where you are. So I want to prepare you for your woe is me moment. I want to tell you the difference between conviction and condemnation. Number one, con conviction is very specific. Notice the scripture says, Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips. God put his finger on the sin that he wanted Isaiah to see. Interesting, pastor, that the messenger of God, God puts his finger on his mouth. But see, condemnation is, is more general. Everything is wrong. You wallow in guilt. I've got a lot of sins. God would say, which ones? Let's talk about the specific ones. And then also, conviction is hopeful, not hopeless. Isaiah's woe is me moment draws him closer to the Lord. Hopelessness sounds like this. Oh, God could never forgive me. Now, with a new awareness of our sin, we've got to choose to confess our sin. Brings us to our next point. Confessing our sin results in forgiveness. Notice what it says in verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Isaiah is a man of unclean lips, and the condition for cleansing is confession. Can you imagine the scene again with me? 
Isaiah is getting given a glimpse into heaven. He sees these big fiery creatures that have wings. And then all of a sudden one of them flies over to the altar and grabs um, the, the, a stone with the tongs. They had wings. Now they got hands. I don't understand that. But, but they grab the, that, 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 that burning coal and begins to fly toward Isaiah. He's probably thinking, I'm done man now. <laughs> He's about to take me out. right? And he takes that coal and he puts it on his lips. It was painful. The act of putting that coal to the lips of Isaiah was an external manifestation of what was happening in the inner man. Can you imagine the intense pain of the burn as that white hot coal hit his lips? But it was a good burn. It represented the cleansing work of God. Isaiah is now pronounced guilty, guiltless. I love this passage. Psalm 32 verse Five, David on the tail end of his sin with Bathsheba and his sin of murder. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to you, Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And finally, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to invite our team to come up here. Let's go back to that scene here of the coal touching Isaiah's lips. This coal has come from the burning altar, and it was dripping in blood. Why? Because the altar is where sin is dealt with. The bloody altar is symbolic of the death of Christ on the cross. Listen, Jesus was put on the cross not, so that you had a, not just so that you had a way into heaven, Jesus was put on the cross as a payment for your holiness. Did you know that you and I are called to be holy? Notice what it says in 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Six times in Scripture, you and I as God's people are commanded to be holy. And Jesus died so that we can actually live a holy life. But what does holiness look like? It doesn't look like perfection. It looks like consistency. It's a life of sinning less and obeying more. It's a life of saying yes to Jesus. Now, I'm not sure what your yes looks like this morning, but did you know Isaiah responded with a yes? Verse 8 said, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for me? And then I said, Here am I. Send me. I like to use my imagination. I just don't tend to think that Isaiah's response was, Here, here am I. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'll go um, if, you, if you want me to. I believe that Isaiah was like, Here am I, Lord. Here am I. Send me, Lord. Send me, Lord. I can't wait to go. And Isaiah was going into the most difficult season of his ministry. But it didn't matter. Because God was sending him. What does your yes look like this week? Maybe loving your spouse and demonstrating love through a servant's heart. Maybe engaging more in the life of your family. Maybe serving the Lord with your time or your talents or your treasures. Maybe coming back this week. Maybe you were thinking, you know, I'm here today, but I wasn't coming back because I'm too busy. Maybe your yes would be to say, you know what, would you be willing to let your schedule die so that I can meet with you? I want to invite you to stand this morning. God is waiting for you to respond to him with confession and repentance. Years ago, in the mines of West Virginia, there was a bunch of miners that got trapped in a mine. And they dug for days and days and days. And finally, they got a little hole, small or big enough that they could fit a flashlight down to the miners. And they sent a flashlight down. And one, of them, one of them turned the light on. And one of the other miners said, Guys, when are you going to turn the light on? You see, they'd already turned it on. 
and turning the light on revealed to that one man his blindness. God's desire this week is to turn the light on and reveal to us our blindness. Maybe this morning you're sitting here and you've listened to this message and you realize that you don't have a relationship at all with this God that Isaiah was able to see. The Bible says today, do not harden your heart. Jesus is calling you and he's saying, I want a relationship with you. Your your staff will be here. Garrett and I will be here. We'd love to tell you about this Jesus. Or maybe you're here this morning and like I said, you weren't planning on coming back this week. And maybe you just need to come and say, Lord, forgive me. My schedule is more important to me than you. Or maybe you're here and you just would need to say, you know what? I'm dry. I'm here every Sunday, but I'm going through the motions. My life is not described by vibrant, victorious, joy-filled, abundant. That's just not where I am. And maybe you need to come and just say, Lord, would you meet with me? Will you not revive me again so that I may rejoice in you? You see, church, we're a people that cry out for God to send fire down upon his altar. We want him to, but God doesn't send fire to an empty altar. There always must be sacrifice on the altar. What's your sacrifice? God, would you meet with your people? Would you give them the ability to respond and come and just get on their face and humble themselves before you? I don't know what their next yes needs to look like. But God, would you move? Would you give us the ability to step out of those pews and come down here and just get on our face and say, Lord, we need you. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. The team's going to lead us in a song. How many of you are willing to say, I need something more than I have right now? And just show that by humbling yourself and coming down here. Spread out, give people room, and just say, Lord, here I am. Meet with me. He's waiting. Lead us, team. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty Early in the morning Our soul shall rise to me Holy with him right now you're having a conversation like this Lord don't make me go down there here's what that conversation translates to God I'd rather have a big me little you I'm not willing to put myself out on the line and come down to that altar because I feel like I have a big me and you're little don't negotiate with God don't debate with him just say yes I get it. You're, gonna, you're thinking, well, people are going to think I'm messed up. They already know. They've been talking about you for weeks. Just get it out in the open. Just a few more. A few more courses. Let's see. Who's willing to say, I'm tired of fighting. I'll humble myself.
God that desires to meet with every single one of us in this room. He sees you. He knows you. And He desperately loves you. He's for you. Again, my prayer is this week that you and I have a woe is me moment with that God. Tonight we're going to meet at 6 p.m. sharp, Lord willing. You're going to hear me say this several times this week. Central Baptist Church, you are not dismissed. You are sent. And you are loved. God bless you. See you tonight.